going live oh snaps we are live my friends what's going on uh no countdown i guess i uh, couldn't even prepare myself damn we're all yes five four three two one uh live we're live what's going on everyone uh how's it going how's everybody doing we are here live with the data science happy hours well now we're officially live my friends what's going on we are live <laughs> i'm live for the third time today uh if you guys are not yet tired of me um you will be soon because i'm going live like crazy I'm going live like crazy for the month of November. Today this is my third live stream. I did a, uh, a live coding session, lecture kind of session earlier today, talking about how ResNet changed the world. Really, how the Skip connection changed the world. Uh, gave like a brief history of um, you know computer vision before deep learning. Then talked about convolutional neural networks and uh, the building blocks, and then you know everything leading up to uh, to to ResNet. And then did a live coding session, seen resonate in action, which is cool. Then I did a session with uh, Jess Ramos. Had a lot of fun talking with her. So hopefully you guys got a chance to join in with that. A couple announcements for what's going on next week. Next week, I've got um, more live sessions happening next week. Uh, doing a live session on Thursday, 12 p.m. Central Time with Mark Ryan, who's the author of uh, Deep Learning for Structured Data. I, for one, am excited for this conversation because, um, you know, there's, I feel like deep learning gets a lot of hate on LinkedIn for some reason, and I don't understand why. And I, well, maybe I have, I have, you know, hypotheses about why, but, uh, but I want to debunk some of those myths and, and, you know, see how it could be applicable for those of us who are, uh, kind of working out of tabular database, things like that. So stay, stay, uh, stay tuned for that. Um, I'll be posting links, uh, on, on LinkedIn for you guys to, to join in. And then again on Friday, I'll be talking about EfficientNet, the EfficientNet family of models, and we'll see that implemented as well uh, in my favorite uh, uh, low-code training library called Supergradients, um, which also happens to be the library put out by Desi. I wonder, coincidence. Uh, also launched the, uh, the the community, Deep Learning Daily, um, deeplearningdaily.community. Guys, check it out. Um, it's I'm trying to build a one-of-a-kind uh, community for deep learning practitioners, those people who are in industry, who are solving difficult problems, um, but also make it welcoming and inviting for people who are early on in the journey. In the community, we've got like people like Kostub and uh, Richmond Alake and uh, Lou uh, Riera, who's, th there's people in there who are like doing like the ML ops side of deep learning and computer vision, which is amazing. And then we've got people who are joining that are kind of earlier on, and then people like me who are kind of meddling in the middle. Um, so it's a community for, for deep learning enthusiasts, it's a place for you guys to come ask questions, join in on live events and all that stuff. And uh, I'm proud of this, you know, building something from the ground up. It's, uh, it's hard work, but I'm happy to be doing it. So I hope you guys can join. Uh, that being said, those of you guys that are watching on LinkedIn, all of your questions and comments are welcome so please do let me know if you got questions or comments and then also all of your engagement all those likes all those reposts those are all welcome as well spread the word man happy hours going on uh you know what else is going on layoffs uh people people getting fired left right center um uh, i wonder who wore it who wore it worst uh let's go to vin and talk about that uh so first vin just give us give us a recap of this week companies are getting laid off and who was doing it uh you know, who, who was wearing it the worst? Go for it, Vin. I think there's something like 30, 35 companies this week, just like this week alone, that ended up laying off in the tech startup space. And bigger ones, you got Stripe that laid off, Lyft laid off, um, Twitter is the big one today. And when you say like, who wore it worst? I think if you're looking at Stripe and Twitter, I think both of those are the worst looks. Because you've got companies that, like, why are you all of a sudden dropping a ton of people? For Twitter, it's because Elon showed up. And it sounds like he violated a bunch of laws. In Ireland, you're supposed to give 30 days before doing a mass layoff. That didn't happen. In the US, in California, I think it's 60 days. That didn't happen. So, it, and not you know, the, the system that he used was something like you got an email or you didn't get an email. And some people were getting locked out of their accounts last night before they got the email. So they were learning because they got kicked off of Slack. Like, that's not the great way to learn. You just got laid off, especially from, you know, a company like Twitter. When you listen to the way people that work there talk to each other, that's a community. You know, a lot of people that work there long-term love that place. 
And so laying them off that way, it, it's everyone now looks at Twitter differently. And it's the same thing with Stripe. And I think, you know, companies like Peloton have done terrible layoff rounds. That's another company that, and what are you doing? But if you look at most companies right now that aren't profitable, you know, their stocks are getting destroyed. And so even if there's no reason for them to lay off, they're going to be laying people off just because their investors are saying, look, you can't, you can't keep losing, you know, like Uber, you can't keep losing like a billion dollars every quarter. You just can't do that. There's no way to have any sort of valuation behind you. So that's what's driving it. Investors are basically saying, look, we're fed up. And I wrote a little bit about how different types of investors are cycling in last week. And one of the big themes now is when you go from long-term investors to short-term investors, short-term investors are all about 12 to 18 months. And so if you've got initiatives that are running, uh, that are going to be profitable for 24, 36 months, they're not going to put up with it. They're going to be saying, just cut that entire group. And so that's what's happening at some of these companies. And the layoffs are being done so badly. You know, there's no such thing as a good layoff, but if you can give people advance notice, if you can talk to people and say, look, this is coming, we're in trouble. Like Google's great job kind of laying the, the groundwork back in June, July. Meta did the same thing. You know, we're tightening our belt. We're, we're going to get smarter about things. Microsoft in different groups that were going to be impacted, did the same thing. They said, you know, it's coming. We've got to reevaluate. We've got to freeze. We got to, you know, we're going to be smarter and more, ta- you know, strategic about how we hire. So there's companies that are doing it better, where they're basically saying, "Look, this is coming," and they've been clear about that for months. So no one's, no one's being caught off guard. Everybody has enough time to prepare. But when you tell somebody, you know, a week in advance, peace. That's just, that's the worst. Uh, Russell, love to hear from you. You had some commentary uh, before we were um, uh, on 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 air. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, shout out Joe Reese. Joe Reese, good to have you here again. Uh, we're talking about uh, layoffs and things like that. So if you got any, uh, yeah, if you got anything uh, on your mind in regards to that, I'll queue you up after uh, Russell. Uh, and then shout out to everybody on LinkedIn who's watching, and uh, Jennifer and Auntie. If you guys got commentary that you wish to contribute, by all means, let me know. Russell, let's hear from you. Thank you, Arpin. Yeah, so my comment was, as an outsider of some uh, denomination, being from the UK rather than the US, uh, I'm interested to know what the uh, the perspective opinion is on these types of layoffs from the big companies, especially Twitter, which I look at being an extraordinary event after Elon Musk has purchased the company and then uh, affected these layoffs, plus the others like the Amazons, uh, the Metas, the Stripes, etc., that are huge big companies that have hired hard for a long time and had a lot of workforce and are looking to make more efficiencies now. So it could be considered perhaps something that could have been strategically forecast a few years ago, possibly. Uh, Is that different to any other technology companies that are operating across the wide spectrum from, uh, you know, Web3 into data, into anything else that's technologically driven? Uh, And if it isn't, is there hope for those that are subject to these layoffs to find employment elsewhere in other companies and where might they best look at this time? Vin or Joe, do you guys want to take a stab at this? Can you maybe paraphrase your question? I wasn't... Uh... Sure, okay. So so I was saying, so the, the people that have been laid off now, the big layoffs from the tech companies, Twitter being kind of in a, in a room on its own, because Elon Musk just took it over. And the other big tech companies have um, hired heavily for a long time and had a lot of people. So maybe it could be considered just an efficiency drive after so many years of a lot of hiring. Uh, Is that different to other technology companies in similar environments that aren't so big or haven't gone through such extreme situations such as Twitter, et cetera, uh, that may not need to lay off so much? And therefore, is there uh, additional advice we can give to those that have been subject to the layoffs of what type of companies to look at if they are exiting the Twitters, uh, the Metas, et cetera? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I know startups that are hiring right now and, you know, companies that are still hiring. And so I, I would say that for those companies, this is a blessing. I mean, this is a, this is the one they've been waiting for, if anything. It's like, if you know how hard it is to find engineers, especially in the Bay Area, um, it's insane. So. 
Yeah, I would, I would say that for people looking for work, you know, I mean, keep your chin up. I know it sucks. It's, I've, I've had that happen before, um, you know, getting laid off. And it's, um, you know, it, it hits your ego, it hits your pocketbook, obviously. But the thing you got to realize is, you know, there's, you know, the, you know, hopefully you have a good network of people and hopefully people are looking out for each other. But, you know, you'll find something, uh, hopefully. Um, but, uh, but the big tech companies, it seems, I mean, there's been a lot of studies on this, uh, or at least a good, good analysis, I would say, of like the... Um, the headcount versus the revenue and versus the uh, the output of these companies. It was just pretty clear. A lot of these, you know, in hindsight, everything's really clear. And now we can, you know, trash talk the decisions that everyone made for the past few years because it's, it's just an easy target. But, you know, there's definitely, a, there was definitely a lot of um, hiring, you know, and uh, kind of uh, overshooting things. And, you know, but the strategy that worked in a zero interest rate environment doesn't work now when rates are high. That's just, it's Warren Buffett always says, you know, uh, interest rates are the gravity on asset prices. And, uh, when the, the party stops, you know, uh, and find a new party, whatever that looks like. So, yeah. You know. It's an interesting point you made there about, um, you know, you, you know how hard it is to find engineers. Um, I, I'm wondering, is there a, um, is there, is there a, a, I don't know if class is the right word. If, is there like a department or function that, uh, is usually up on the chopping block before, everyone else i mean my intuition tells me that if we're, if we're hitting a recession we're going to downsize we should probably start getting rid of hr people first but i don't know if that's correct or not uh but i'd love to get your insights on that uh vin by the way those of you guys watching on linkedin uh smash that like y'all smash that like and uh, let me know if you got questions um for, i don't know what's been going on with linkedin i can't see comments during my live stream so if you do have a question uh please do send it to me as a pm and i'll make sure we get it up here uh dm whatever the hell it's called uh go for it vin yeah don't be a recruiter right now that's just Oh my goodness. I feel horrible for recruiting departments that are losing 75. I mean, I've heard 10 person teams going down to one, you know, it, it's just brutalizing right now, especially in tech companies who are looking at the recruiting team and saying, uh, you're all gone. Marketing's another one that's just been getting hammered and it's not marketer, you know, the the top end marketers themselves, the people that are really good at being creative and building the campaigns. It's the administrative and support staff that have just been whole, oh. you know, and at the at sort of the lower entry level in marketing, it's been brutal if you're in any of those types of roles. And so if you're, you know, if you're thinking about getting into data science from a different role, it's, you know, race into maybe an analyst role, take something that's a little bit lower down right now, chase into a, maybe a software engineering role or a data analysts role, try to get into something out of recruiting, something that's outside of marketing. Like I said, those entry level roles, or if you can get into one of those creative roles, great spot to be in. The other teams that get absolutely devastated are innovation and advanced R&D teams. Any company right now that's looking at an initiative, you know, 24 to 36 months out, like I said, before it's going to produce any sort of revenue, those are going to be on the chopping block and any teams that are the primary engineers, developers, data scientists, they're going to be going with them. In some companies, you're going to have the opportunity to transfer, which is cool. There's there's a kind of stack ranking though. So if you're not one of the high performers on that team, you may not have a, a seat when the hokey pokey is over. So it's really looking at yourself with does your team support core business? Is it essential? Is the role that you have essential or would a slowdown in business mean that you're not as necessary as you used to and you don't need as many people to service the accounts that you have? That's another one that's going to be in trouble. And if you're, you know, really, if you're a low performer right now at a company, great time to cycle out because in the next 12 months, if you're in that bottom 50%, you're pretty much, I mean, I don't want to say guaranteed because nothing's a guarantee, but if you're in that bottom 50%, you're in a lot of, a lot of danger of being laid off. And sometimes it's just better to start clean. You can end up going from a low performer at the bad job to a high performer at a better place for you. As a developer relations professional who's typically housed in marketing, your words frighten me. Should I be? Should I be worried? Should DevRel is DevRel uh, and developer advocacy, uh, you know, especially those within marketing functions, at risk? And if so, what can I do to to help secure my job? And I, uh, Jennifer, I saw you had your hand up. So if you had a question, we'll we'll get to, to you right after. 
go for that. I think if you're in DevRel, you're, you're going to be safe at some companies. If you're at a machine learning company, deep learning company, anything that's data science first, data first, data engineering first, ML engineering, ML ops, yeah, you're pretty safe because without a developer relations role, I mean, it's really hard to get anybody to buy until they understand why they're buying, what they're buying, what they'll get out of it, how to pitch it to the C-level so that they can get some budget and approval for it. So in those companies, they understand the ROI. Or as long as they do understand the ROI, then you're in pretty good shape. But in other companies who are just toying with the DevRel, especially companies where software isn't their core business, that's where there's a lot of risk because some companies are looking at it as a growth area and so far it hasn't come it hasn't gotten to positive revenue generation and it doesn't really have a good path to pro- profitability those are the areas where marketing spends on anything really is in jeopardy makes me feel better thank you Vin. uh jennifer you had your hand raised uh go for it good to see coach live in the house coast have got the mic and the headphones god damn look at you man uh go for it jennifer <laughs> Uh, really, just to add on to what Vin said, anything that isn't part of a business's core value chain is going to be at risk. Like at Intel, we also put PMs and operations in with the other cost centers that are evaluated in times like this, um, or teams where management believes that a function could be done centrally and support a broad audience. That's another one that's sometimes at risk. Now, let me tell you the flip side, and this goes back to Russell's question. A friend of mine was um, was given notice at Intel several weeks ago. I think it's just two and a half, maybe three weeks ago now. He is already deep into interviews, expecting two or more offers next week. So yes, it it stinks and I am troubled that Intel is letting him go. But at the same time, I'm thrilled that there is a marketplace for um, analytics, for engineers. It's still out there. It's a shift. Yeah, 20,000 20, layoffs or something like that. That's, that's huge. Um, if Bloomberg was not accurate, it was an uh, inaccurate rumor. But yeah, uh, it's still so. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I remember being at the Intel Innovation Conference uh, just a few weeks ago, months ago, I can't remember. Uh, it was recently-ish. Uh, they're coming out with some new uh, like GPUs and stuff that I'm really excited, yeah. like, excited for. That's going to be yeah. you know, definitely definitely a game changer. Kosa, uh, hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? Uh, nice setup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it's uh, worth a bit of an update. I don't know how this sounds. I'll find out when I hear the no, it's recording. Good, man. It's good. Do you want to be host? Do you want to take over? Looks good. <laughs> Depends. Do you mind the unnecessary levels of reverb? Um, but <laughs> Dope. No, I just got this thing plugged into my uh, mixer that I use for practice and stuff. So uh, I just thought I'd update it. Um, the job market in Sydney is 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 weird. It's in it's in a strange spot right now. Like, I mean, I'm just listening to what you guys are saying so far, and it, it's it's weird because we've got the same kind of thing, right? Like, we're seeing some companies laying off thirty percent of their force, forty percent of their force in in australia right and not just in sydney like brisbane melbourne etc and and we've got other companies that are doing pretty well and you know just snapping up talent so it's weirdly a bullish market for people looking for jobs but also at the same time you're seeing people on the other end of the spectrum as well so it, it's it's strange again it comes down to something we've discussed a few times in the past right is that where is that band of four to 10 year kind of experienced people um, that, you know, have enough experience to make a significant impact, but also aren't right at that top end of the, the spectrum in terms of pay for companies to actually be able to afford people. So I, I think that's what we're seeing play out at this, at this stage. And I mean, we've, we've got like a kind of a controlled uh, inflation situation going on in, in Australia right now, where, you know, every, every month or so, the reserve bank is bumping up interest rates by like 0.25%, 0.5% kind of thing, just to kind of avoid jumping neck deep into a, into a recession. I don't know the first thing about that, but what I'm seeing is companies just getting really wary on where they're investing their, uh, their talent and just kind of consolidating it into experienced talent more than anything. Um, now, 
I just don't know what that looks like. I have no experience in any of this. this is the first time that I'm seeing any kind of significant economic change in my career. So I'm I'm just like keeping an eye on the horizon and going, okay, interesting stuff. Um, but at the same time, there are so many companies hiring that I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it, right? <laughs> so it still seems pretty positive all up. That uh, Vivian got to uh, uh... Oh, and that's not Vivian, that's Vin. But I just shout out to Vivian, good to have you here, Vivian. Uh, Vivian saying, can your Fed call our Fed and work on that, not jump in face first in the recession thing? Talk to us a little bit about that. And uh, I want to go to uh, Joe after that, because Joe, you were recently in Australia. I'm wondering what you, uh, what thoughts you have around the uh, um, Australian like data science, data engineering type of market. Uh, but first, Vin, then Joe. And if anybody has questions, whether you are on LinkedIn or YouTube or wherever it is that you're watching, please do let me know. I'm happy to take all of your questions and comments. Yeah, I'm just, our currency in the US right now is like a sledgehammer or a wrecking ball more like when you look globally. Trying to do business right now in the EU or anywhere is so much harder than it was six months ago. That's kind of it. We're raising rates really, really fast comparative to most other countries. And so the U.S. dollar is just going, it's so much higher than all other currencies that we're taking hits, you know, with all the companies that are doing business internationally. And like my courses internationally have basically they're 20% more expensive now than they were six months ago. And trying to normalize pricing internationally right now has been a nightmare. So there's, yeah, we need to, we need to call up. Uh, maybe some people on the Fed and say, I, you know, yes, raise interest rates. Maybe not as fast. Maybe, maybe slow it down. You know, stretch it out a little bit more. You, we got time. We have months. We can we, we slow it down a little bit. Maybe not seventy five every single time. As somebody who is uh, going to be building a house soon, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that these uh, rates cool down. Ooh, I'm sorry. Quite quickly. <laughs> well, you know, we're still, the land is, you know, land is secure. We just need to. I just, uh, I just finished Paul Volcker's um, uh, autobiography. That was fascinating. Um, and it's called Keeping At It. And Paul Volcker's the person who uh, crushed the back of inflation back in the, uh, uh, the, eight, the early 80s. Um, but it was interesting getting his take because he, uh, there's a bit of a head fake when, um, so inflation it, for context had been running rampant in the 70s and, and through the uh, early 80s in the order of like double digit inflation like i think the fed fund rate was like 11 percent, and mortgage rates were 18 percent at their high um which when you think about that cost of borrowing is insane so i mean and inflation was obviously running really high as a reason it's why you had to raise rates um and so his whole thing was you just have to be very merciless with this thing it's a monster that if you don't kill it it will come back which it did the head fake part was um you know inflation looked like it was under control so it took the, the brakes off and um came roaring back and so uh uh, in Volcker's view, and I think this is what Powell's doing, is it, it, it's just you have to kill this at all costs. If you have to crash the economy and um, there's collateral damage, then it is what it is. It sucks, but uh, you get that or you potentially get a much worse situation with inflation. If you've seen hyperinflationary economies, that's, that's not very fun either. So it's, um, anyway, but that's what happens when you print uh, trillions of dollars and um, you know, carpet bomb the economy with it and so that's uh, super fun australia though let's talk australia what a great country got hung out with costa but uh, it's great to great to meet you in sydney um yeah the data, data community there is awesome it's it's uh, alive and well i feel like there's um you know it's uh, um yeah it, it's 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 going strong so i was in melbourne and, and sydney and i felt like both communities were, were awesome everyone seemed pretty positive at least as far as i met um the economy in Australia felt like it was different. I talked to an American who actually lives there, and he felt like it was um, America. Uh, it's it's like America, but things just move a lot slower there. It, it's don't, you know, in America is a land of like extreme ups and downs. There's not really like a middle here. It's not like you sort of uh, you know when, when the, the highs are highs and the lows are lows, and you know we're going to low lows. But when it's high, it's real high. Um, it's pretty schizophrenic uh, around here. So but Australia felt a lot more even keeled, but even so, you could definitely tell that. Um, you know, people were kind of skittish when I would talk to people about, you know, the prospects of, you know, their employment and whatnot. And uh, it's the same here. So it just seems to be everywhere. And same with the UK. I was just in London, actually, and saw Russell there, um, you know, and uh, that, was, that was cool to hang out. But same, same sort of thing, you know, um, 
I don't think anyone really, was really really stoked in the situation. I mean, I went live visit Russell. I mean, your prime minister was on the way out. So it was like, if people would ask about America, I'd be like, well, at least we're not, we don't have that problem this week. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's strong American dollars. It's a good thing if you're traveling, but it's a crappy thing if you have to export anything. So I felt like going to Australia was awesome. And England, I felt like going to Mexico. So it was great. <laughs> I, uh, I get paid in U.S. dollars for living in Canada, and it's beautiful. I love it. Um, oh, lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> make more than most doctors in Canada, which is funny. Uh, shout out to people. Uh, for some reason, it's hard for me to see uh, live comments on LinkedIn, but um, I, I do see a few here. Shout out to Rodney Beard. Man, I haven't seen Rodney or heard from Rodney in a very long time. Good to have you back here, Rodney. Uh, Warren Simmons is saying, uh, I have seen several uh, recessions since 1990 in the markets where I've worked. What things holds true, keep true to your ethical standards in whatever you do and maintain your standards. Be compassionate with your colleagues who get the chop. What goes around comes around. I, what are your thoughts on like uh, uh, Elon Musk? Like, uh, Just blame everything on Elon Musk, but those Twitter layoffs, those fake fake Twitter layoffs like he hired actors to to pretend to be like fired and then all I saw all week long on my Twitter feed was people uh, poking fun at that like I was I was the PM in charge of like the bookmark thing or something like that um, yeah what are your thoughts on that hiring actors to pretend like they got uh, the did you see the names of the people though that were strategically chosen names yeah. so when they were <laughs> reported in a certain order yeah you know yeah yeah yeah, I thought that was uh, that was interesting. Um, yeah, so so, how do you tell if if a recession is going to come for your particular role? What are some warning signs you should look out for? Um, yeah, let's let's talk about that, uh, Vin. Uh, we'll go to use uh, the the resident uh, expert on, on layoffs. Uh, what what signs should I look look for at my company? to kind of gauge whether or not I should temper my fear of getting laid off. The big one is when people stop caring about what your deliverables are, like that's a huge, that's big. And that usually happens maybe a month or two before you end up getting laid off because these decisions are usually made beginning a quarter or a quarter in advance because there's a lot of record, reporting requirements and that sort of thing. So you'll know about uh, 30 to 90 30 to 90 days in advance if your workload suddenly isn't on anyone's radar you're not getting invites to meetings that you used to no one cares like pms don't talk to you about your deliverables anymore if you're asking you know what are we going to be working on after this project and no one really knows if you're supporting a business unit that they keep talking about winding down and they don't tell you where you're going next, that's, you know, there's most leaders will give you the hint, hint, nudge, nudge warning that something's going to happen. Nobody can say you're about to get laid off. But if you're looking for, you know, kind of your workload falling off a cliff or your involvement in other projects falling off a cliff, that's your leaders giving you the, you know, the, uh, yeah, no, your job's, it's totally safe. And the biggest rule is if you have a first round of layoffs and somebody specifically comes to your team from a very high executive level position and tells you all your job is safe, it's not. You're done. You're in a lot of trouble. That's, that's like the biggest lie. And it only happens when they intentionally come to your group and tell you, no, everything's cool. It's not. Anybody have thoughts or comments on that? Uh, Vivian, go for it. Good to see you again, my friend. It's been hey. so long. I know. I'm sorry. Oh, Actually, sorry. my partner, Eric, had surgery. He had an acoustic neuroma taken out of his head, which is a fun thing. I encourage everybody to look up. Um, anyway, so that's I've, I've been like dealing with him having that surgery lately. Um, anyway, I wanted to mention also um, that sometimes you just really don't know when you're going to be laid off and it really comes as a surprise and there are no warning signs and I don't know I guess I just feel like as someone who's been laid off a couple times um, when the market starts looking scary or 
you know, we're in times like this. I just always like have a card in my back pocket of like what I'm going to do, you know? And I definitely don't think that that's a stupid idea to like create your backup plan, you know? But as someone who has been part of layoffs before, the good thing is that I've never, I've never been part of a layoff on which there was truly no like compensation or something like at least like a few weeks or something of pay first. And so then, then that's kind of how I like usually think about it is like, okay, if I found out tomorrow that I only have like four more weeks or like two months or whatever of, of work of pay left, like what, what would I do? And like, how could I prepare myself to like, if I get that news, like be willing to jump so that I can like act quickly. So I don't know. I think that it's great to try to look out for like what Vin was talking about, but sometimes it truly is like a surprise even to your boss or even to your boss's boss. And like, I mean, unfortunately that's the world we live in. And sometimes you just really don't know. And it really comes as a huge shock and surprise. And the best thing you can do is like be ready to spring should the bad news come. But since you're at Meta and that ever happens to you, you could always teach people how to get into data science because you have that clout. <laughs> I mean, right. I guess so. Yeah. I don't want to lose my job. I like <laughs> no. my job, but I do. There are a lot of people that have been like, oh, well, you're fine because you now have Meta on your resume. Mm -hmm. And I guess in perspective, I, I am grateful for that, but I also still really don't want to lose my job. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be thinking about that, right? Like, okay, like if I was to ever lose my job, at least I, I think I know what I need to do in order to like pick shit up and, and do stuff like on my own immediately. Like I've, I've taken enough of those, of, of those marketing courses <laughs> to know what I could do to kind of uh, build something from scratch, but, um, yeah, never, never want to actually lose my job, especially cause I, I love it, dude. Like I, you know, I, I see all these posts on, on LinkedIn from these, you know, and, and Twitter from these people talking about the rat race and, you know, working nine to five, blah, blah. It's like, dude, like I kind of like having an actual job. Like I love it. Like it, it's cool. Like I love the work I do. I love the company I'm at and it's a lot of fun. Uh, Kosev, go for it. I, I yeah, this is something that's been playing on my mind a fair bit in the last, like, maybe the last week or so, right? I mean, um, there is, I can't remember what the, there's a particular term for this, but there's a law, someone please shout it out if you know which it is, but where negative news or, or lies garner more attraction than truth or positive news. Um, and while I, well, I'm in no way telling people not to speak out when they're facing negative work circumstances, I think we can very quickly and easily rabbit hole into just, you know, the algorithm feeding us more examples of people hating their job, right? It's so easy to fall down that spiral and rabbit hole. And then you start turning around and looking at every job and every company and every person is out oh, there to get me and they're out to, you know, uh, you know, lowball me on my salary and do all sorts of terrible corporate, uh, corporate crap to me. Right. Um, it, it's, it all, it almost turns into at some point, I want to turn that noise off in the week. Like earlier this week, I was like, actually, I'd, I'd like to hear a few more positive stories uh, about people enjoying their job or people excited about the work that they're doing. Right. Um, because everything we're doing, all the all the technology that we're working on, we all got into it because it's crazy exciting, right? Um, and we don't hear the stories shared nearly as much. Uh, either that or the algorithm's been feeding me some seriously negative stuff for the last two years, right? <laughs> One way or the other, I'm not entirely sure which. Um, but I do think we do tend not to um, share as much the positive aspects of day-to-day -day work. Um, Speaking of positive things, huge shout out to uh, Eric Sims, just got his house. So uh, that's positive news, man. Eric Sims, if you're listening, if you're watching, 
shout out to you, man. Super happy for you. Super excited for you. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I love being a developer. I, I like it better than being a, a data scientist, uh, to be completely honest. I, I absolutely love uh, DevRel more than just being a data scientist. And I think it's just personality thing. It's like uh, I get to teach, which I like to do. I get to create content, which is fun. Uh, and I don't have to worry about uh, 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 fighting uphill battles for data strategy uh, and get, <laughs> getting that shit, uh, you know, done. There's there's other strategy battles I gotta I gotta fight, but uh, for the most part, I'm I'm excited to fight those type of battles. Uh, Vin, what's uh, what's some commentary on that? On that, I see I see you cracking up. <laughs> Yeah, there's, it's, yeah, strategies, it's a good business to be in right now, but yeah, there's a whole lot of knife fights happening at the sea level right now. And it's because we're swapping from FOMO running the business and technology running the business because of FOMO to strategies back. And many of the strategists now have access to grind because they've been kind of slapped around for the last five years. So there's... Yeah, there's some knife fights going on right now. There's some interesting politics coming back into play. It, it, it's weird to watch the pendulum swing so hard so fast to strategy being everything now. And anytime you hear anybody talking on an investor call, it's always strategy. You know, we're going back to core strategy, returning to a more strategic way of this, that, or the next thing. So, yeah, I'm having fun, but I can imagine literally no one else would. Is there a difference between like strategy and process? Um, one thing I'm, I, I know about myself is that um, I, I don't like too much rigorous process. For some reason, too much process feels like it creates too much chaos and entropy for me. Like I prefer to, to have as minimal process as possible, but I feel like that is different than strategy. Yeah, process is more your workflow. And so you can have a process for strategy planning. You can have a process for implementing strategy. So there's connections there, but that's really the steps, workflow, work products, judging quality, assessing when you're done, building timelines and that sort of thing. So strategy can dictate process and strategy contains processes and frameworks and systems. But when you start talking about real, you know, digging down to the process, like what you're saying, that's more workflow and trying to maximize, optimize. Some people really like structure. And I think the, the more creative you are, the more you rebel against structure, but the more you end up benefiting from structure because you, you'll realize your creativity can actually be applied to making your job better. And it's one of the things Bill Gates used to say, I, I hire lazy people because they always figure out the fastest way to do something, lowest effort, easiest way. And he was really talking about optimizing processes. It was just a fun way of saying the same thing where he hires people that optimize because they don't want to work hard on a particular item. And so there's some strategy to that. And even creative people, you know, you can build more, you can create more if you have a structured rigorous process for it. It just feels like you're constrained because you don't really get the opportunity to continuously improve. But if you look at concepts like lean or uh, real manufacturing types of continuous improvement in Six Sigma, it's a really creative process because anyone at any point can step up and say, look, I think that's busted and here's a better way to do it. And if you can prove it, your idea now is the process. I like that. I like that a lot. Thank you, Vin. Uh, I hire lazy people. I love that. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Like the type of process I hate is, uh, um, just like the the nitty grittiness, like and what I mean by that is like okay, if I'm if I'm doing a a certain thing, then there's like twelve different other things that's associated with that one thing that I need to get done, and I feel like it gets in the way of getting the most important thing done. That I'm being kind of abstract there. Um, but speaking of process, uh, Costum's kind of moved into a role where I think process is a lot more uh, important. Process strategy, you're you're doing like the uh, data pipelines and 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 stuff like that. Uh, you know, with respect to computer vision and, and deep learning, which is, which is interesting and fascinating. And, you know, you're mentioning to me that you've been reading Joe's book a lot for, uh, for, for guidance there. Um, talk to us about that. How's that shift moving from, uh, the engineer model builder to the 
So, so I'm moving back into the pipeline building space. Like I, probably over the last year, what happened was I went from full-time model builder to, hey, pipeline builder, because we don't have our data labeled because it was at a new role. And then the last probably eight or nine months have been working predominantly on the, you know, operationalizing those pipelines. And a lot of it comes down to what um, processes do you have in place to use a lot of the tools that you've got? Because you're never going to have, like, it's a, it's a beautiful state that we all dream about as engineers where everything is automated and everything has got code for it, right? Not everything is code. And in order to plug in all the gaps, that takes a lot of development time, right? So where you can't um, automate it or where you can't design it out, you have to have some element of process thinking that that comes into it, right? Um, and even when designing uh, your systems, having that understanding of what the actual process is uh, often helps you find really uh, efficient solutions to it from a code standpoint, right? Um, so... I found, and I always find that it's different kind of thinking. Now, I, I, I'm sure you guys would have all heard of disk analysis at this point, but for people who haven't out there, <laughs> Vin's got that smile on his face. I'd love to know what your thinking is on, on disk profiles. Um, but from what I've seen, this uh, so for people who haven't heard about it, disk is basically dominance. Uh, I think it's uh, influence, uh, stability, and... Uh, compliance right now typically high compliance personalities not me um are typically very process oriented and are very uh happy to follow protocols to the t because they see the value in that right um and they're able to follow that it's just a natural personality thing now everyone has like an adaptive and a natural personality my adaptive personality is a lot more process oriented so i can switch into that earlier earlier on in my career probably five years ago i wasn't able to switch into that at all like yeah. that's not my natural mode of thinking but i've started to see that value in having that side of it um so i can switch into that as needed the interesting thing is when you've got a team that all of us uh you know don't have that aspect in our natural personalities it makes it quite difficult to come up with solid processes and actually follow them because there's a much bigger uh, likelihood that we'll want to design our way out of trouble, right? Uh, or use our expertise and our, our own skills because oh, it's just quicker for me to throw together a quick script to do that as opposed to think about a process that's kind of bulletproof that anyone could follow, right? Um, but the downside of that is that you've got a team where people are working for long periods uh, with their adaptive personality. And that's pretty tiring, right? Like try that for six months, 10 months. It, it, it gets very, um, very tiring for a lot of people, right? And that's, that's quite honestly the truth. So it kind of comes down to what side, like what, at what stage is your, is your organization out or your product out or your, you know, your process and tooling at, and what's the right balance of personalities that you need on your team? Because skills can be taught, right? Natural personalities, having people who can think a bit differently, people with a different background and experience, right? The I the only reason I have even remotely some idea of what uh, you know a high compliance personality would do or process thinking would do is because I was really bad at it five years ago. Um, spent some time in manufacturing and they showed me that weakness in a big way because the people out there were fantastic at it, right? And I just didn't have a clue. Um, so over the years, I kind of built up on that weakness and just said, okay, I need at least a bare minimum and to the point that it's become something that I can switch on when I really need to, right? Um, but from a process thinking standpoint, that that's the main thing is you've got to be able to identify the value in processes. We, especially in the data science and the machine learning kind of community, I think so many of us uh, prefer to be model builders, right? We prefer to be, and, and the weird thing about that is, I mean, look at the code, look at data science code. It's low compliance. How much testing do you see in data science code? How much engineering rigor do you see in data science code, right? Like <laughs> you're laughing, Humphrey, because you know exactly what I'm talking about. It, it, like we're only starting to turn that curve now. And people like uh, Mikiko, people like Joe, they're they're ahead of the game in terms of looking at things like MLOps and data uh, and data engineering and things like that. Because there's that realization that hey, actually, guys, we can't do this all as experimental notebooks. 
we need to start thinking about how do we apply engineering rigor. And that's both from software engineering rigor, but also process rigor that we've had in every form of engineering for the last few hundred years, right? Um, so that that's where like I'm, I'm leaning back on some of those books. Like I've started reading more of Joe's book to just get a better understanding of more data pipelines. And because I'm heading back into the data pipeline uh, aspect of things with the job that I start on Tuesday. Super excited about that. But um, basically, yeah, it's we just need to understand that there is a bit of a heavy keel towards your more experimental personalities in the industry. Um, and we're slowly seeing that turn the curve, right? We're starting to see a larger variety of personalities enter that barrier for expertise get lowered. So more people from different backgrounds are coming in. Um, I think we'll see that level out as we need robustness. We'll bring in the practices that robustness needs, put it this way, right? Nothing, nothing that was designed as a safety need mechanism was ever designed before it was needed, right? Halos on formula one cars didn't exist right for a very long time like the the front stalk of the halo didn't exist uh and i was watching a, i forgot who it was but there was a video of a formula one driver from a few years ago before the halo was there getting hit above the left eye by a spring right and it's just mind mind-blowing that that's a dangerous situation that they hadn't considered now the halo was brought in to deal with that go back to what was it the 60s the tylenol poisonings right? Um, in, I think it was Chicago, right? We didn't have like tamper proof bottle tops on that. That seems so obvious now, but we wait until we need robustness. We wait until we need systems before we actually build them. And we're starting to see that acceptance of, Hey, we need good data engineering come into play. Right. And probably that reflects at a strategy level, like what you were saying before, Vin, where previously it was just, we just need to go fast. And now they're like, hang on, we need to do this right. So the, that's the main shift that I'm seeing from a high level. And I'm and I'm kind of excited to head more and more into the, hey, build more data pipelines, build more, uh, you know, ML engineering stuff as opposed to, you know, the models themselves. And I'm starting to see that that value be recognized more by employers and companies, right? Whereas previously, every company was just looking for data scientists. Right now, companies are actually like, no, we we have data scientists. We also need ML engineers. We recognize they're different and the value that they add. So, it's a little bit of an ego swallow, right? Like I spent like a couple of years learning, doing a master's degree on how do I build models and all that stuff, and now I'm not building any models. Am I still adding value? That that's the ego pill for me to swallow and understand that yes, I am, in these ways that other people probably can't add value in, right? Um, so those are the things that are going through my head when you talk about, hey, process world versus going from building models to building processes and building pipelines. That's the mindset shift that I've been kind of traversing the last year or so. I'm quite enjoying it, actually. That's awesome, man. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've never been like part of a proper engineering team and I have ne never had anybody like to show me like the ropes. I've always, my roles have always been like, you know, statistician, data scientist, and not, you know, much engineering, like people around me. I wonder like, uh, how, how can somebody like, you know, that, that's being the solo data scientist, maybe they don't have all that support or a robust team to learn all these practices. Like what, what do they start doing to, to learn these type of, you know, mindset shifts that you're talking about, essentially. Go join those teams. Yeah. Like I, all due respect to all the books and courses out there, they will help you. You'll get that 10%, 20% knowledge that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. That's just helping you get access to information. That's secondhand, thirdhand learning, right? Go join those teams. Otherwise you're never going to get to see it in practice, right? Like, Honestly, I was at a robotics company uh, from 2020 through to 2021, mid 2021. Um, and it was great. I was building models all the time. And I was building stuff that I look back at today going, you're insane. You're wasting a lot of energy building that stuff, right? Um, if I just built it right. And I didn't have the team around me to tell me what the right way is to build it. So I ended up building arguably some really janky shit, which still runs well today right like that that's just 
I'm I'm thankful that I wasn't that much of a dope that I built something that's going to explode the moment that I leave. Right? It's it's still running a year or so later. Um, but would I do it differently now? Absolutely, because I went and joined that team to have a look at how to how do teams outside of robotics do this? Because I know teams outside of robotics do this, right? Like CI/CD for models and model development pipelines. That's not rocket science. Like I mean. It's it's really not like I've, many 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 teams are doing this to the point that we have like literally dozens of off the shelf tools begging and vying for our attention, right? So how do we actually do this? That was my kind of initial quest, right? Um, and now I'm kind of extending that further, right? So I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity to see that firsthand, and I don't think the the lessons learned would have been there firsthand without the right team in there. Um, you can learn to a point on your own and then you start to plateau and then you need seniors, you need principals who have four, five, 10 years on you, right? Like it's, it's yeah, you need that, you really do. Um, and you need the the time on the job to be able to focus on that as well, right? Um, when you're highly operational, where the, the uh, you know, the pipelines are already up and built, you're not going to get many opportunities to go through and examine how the pipeline is built because you're focusing on operationalizing those pipelines and actually using them to, you know, deliver the outcomes. That is a very different role. You're not going to get the chance to spend the time in building the pipelines and re-architecting and getting your designs reviewed, go from literal design review stage, right? Um, it's just not going to happen nearly as much. Uh, so yeah, no, go join those teams. Find the people with gray hairs, more more gray hairs than you, and ask them every question that comes to mind, and just drain their knowledge. That that's kind of my goal right now. Um, Don't get fooled by people by, with gray hair because I have a lot and I know nothing. Uh, so uh, Rodney's saying excellent points. Coast if I could finally see comments on the LinkedIn post, but uh, yeah, excellent points. Um, any uh, any other questions, comments going on? Anything else on anybody's mind? Vin, go for it, man. Yeah, actually, I actually have a question for Joe. I was just uh, kind of listening through all of this. Are you seeing a change from partnering data science or data engineers with data scientists and more preference for data engineers and data analysts kind of backing away from the data scientist being involved at day zero and seeing more hiring towards that direction where instead of the data scientist being dragged in it's really a data analyst being partnered with data engineer and getting more value out of that. Hmm. I haven't seen anything change just yet, but I, I, I sense what you're, uh, I'm, you know, uh, I'm picking up what you're putting down. So I, 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 I think that that might be the case soon. It's a data scientist is a very nebulous uh, title to begin with, but, um, you know, so what I've seen is, you know, it's the same stuff we've been talking about for a long time, right? It's the, the, the artists of nebulous data scientists, basically. It's like, what have you been hired to do this whole time? And, uh, well, now you're about to find out. <laughs> and so any, uh, any, anything that uh, hasn't been yielding results, I think will be cut. But I could say the same thing about data engineering, to be frank, and, and analysts, where if you're not, if you haven't been producing anything of, of uh, tangible value for, um, I guess, during the good times, then... Um, well, you should either start doing that very, very immediately, or um, you know you won't be doing much of that at the company you're at. So that's that's the tone I'm starting to get. Is I think there's definitely a refocus in general, just on like every uh, conceivable way of either trying to make more money while you can, uh, kind of you know refocusing things or just cutting where it's definitely not going to yield anything for a bit. So. Um, that, that's the general sense that I get over the wall. But I haven't seen any specific, um, I would say, roles being targeted just yet, yet being the key word. What about you? Yeah, I, I've i been hearing about the we're focused more on hiring analysts. But I'm wondering if that's just, you know, people talking about it at a higher level or if that's actually something that's ground floor happening yet. You know, because I'm here, that's kind of the thing about when I hear someone say at the sea level, hey, we're going to focus more on this, or we're going to focus more on that role, and we're going to do this kind of partnership. It's like, okay, yeah, but are you really? And so I, I, I never know when it's real or when it's smoke. Well, the thing with analysts, too, is you need something to analyze, right? Like, there has to be some sort of, 
you know, you're moving the needle on something. But um, so I guess it depends on how mature that function has, has become, you know, before things kind of dropped off a cliff. So if, if those scenes are adding value, great, you know, um, hopefully that continues. But, you know, and, and, a large, and, and I think I would like to think that most companies, I give them benefit of it out and I hope that they're, you know, investing their money wisely. But, you know, uh, endless amounts of free money mass a lot of stupid mistakes too. And now you're about to find out. Uh, I guess as Buffett says, who's been swimming naked uh, when the tide goes out. So, um, might be a huge nudist colony for all I know. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, wait, do I mean less data science magic bean panacea? Yeah. It, it It's kind of interesting that I think from what I'm hearing, leadership's asking the question, you know, what's the difference between a data analyst and a data scientist? Which ones do we need? When do we put one on a project, not the other? Because, you know, the salary is like half. You can hire a data analyst for anywhere between 100 and, you know, 85,000 to 120,000. Trying to get a data scientist for less than 200K now is, it's hard. So that's what they're looking at is there, there, there's actually like a conversation that I'll hear from time to time, you know, which, who do we need on this? What department do we need on this? Which you know, should we be hiring more of this versus that? That's the conversation I'm hearing. But like I said, I don't, I don't know if that's going to turn into something or is that just this month's conversation? Well, it, these things have a weird way of working themselves out too. Cause it's like, you know, execs talk to each other, right. At different companies, cause they're trying to compare notes. And, and I feel like it's, it's like a lot of things where it, it, people follow fast, even if it makes no sense. And so it's like, Oh, I'm going to cut my data teams. Like, yeah, well, F them. Let's let's cut those guys too. So it's, you know, because a lot of this. I mean, recessions are a weird thing where it's you know you're you're trying to forecast the future and recessions occur precisely because everybody starts cutting and, and cutting back, right? It's not like these things just sort of happen and independent. It's a demand just drops off, but demand um, uh, there's uh, there's a lot of reflexivity as a Soros calls it. Um, so you know these. These things have feedback loops, and when execs talk to each other about their hiring or more to the point firing plans right now, then I, I, I think that uh, um, there's a lot of comparing notes. So, you know, it's it, this is this isn't like a fine art, <laughs> the art of like cutting your teams, right? It's just like you know, uh, how do you? I mean, what is it's a question that I think well, a lot of people here have been mentioning over a while, which is how are you assessing ROI in the first place? You know, Ben's been talking about this in the you know, in the boom times and, um, you know, if you're tracking how ROI has been calculated, I suppose it should be a pretty easy exercise for you to figure out you either keep or you cut, but if it wasn't providing ROI back then, I don't know why you're keeping everyone around in the first place. It seems a bit silly, but, um, you know, we might think we've managed to do a really good job at uh, running things that, that have the appearance of businesses, but, uh, aren't really run as businesses. So, but that's changing. I'm, I'm curious about that. That, that last statement about uh, running things that have the appearance of businesses but aren't really businesses. Like, what what would be kind of an example of that? Well, I mean, I think the entire startup ecosystem, for example, is an example of this. Where uh, you know, to call it as it is, I mean, you have a lot of companies that were flush with uh, you know VC cash and you know, or, or, or incentivized to growth. I mean, when I would talk to startups, you know, they're, I asked them, are you incentivized by you know revenue, profit, or logos? And logos was you know, the, the, um, the driving factor for a lot of these companies in terms of, you know, I need to get more logos and that's how I'm going to get my next round. Um, um, revenue was, I mean, so you'd see these like kind of dinky deals, you know, that coming through, but it's as long as you're logo collecting, that's what mattered. But at the last time I checked, I don't think logos paid the bills, uh, as for real businesses. If I, Ben or I tried to run our business on logos alone, I mean, we'd, we'd be out of business in like two seconds and that's the reality of it. But uh, and most businesses are, you know, they do these weird things. They make revenues and profits. It's a very strange idea. And, um, you know, you, you can look at Wikipedia and find these, how it's calculated. But, uh, um, you know, this, this, this fad of profits and revenue, it's slowly catching on. And so that's what I mean. These, these, by, by, the, by the official term of what a business does, right, it, it generates profits and cash flows and returns those to shareholders. Um, that's literally the mechanism of, of what a business is, right? Until then, it's um, like I said, it's 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 on, it's something that's on its way to becoming a business. But I, I wouldn't say it's strictly defined as a business. So that's what I mean. It's play business. So I like that. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, I it, 
to define what a playing at business is. My daughter makes more money every month than Uber does. <laughs> Ouch. But that's the whole point, right? I mean, think of how much money went into Uber. You know, I mean, colossal amounts. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know that they'll ever turn a dime of profit that, that's going to recoup that, right? Or so... And you can, you, can, you can play all the shenanigans you want about EBITDA and all this other stuff, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, either making money or you aren't. And, you know, as Munger calls it, uh, EBITDA is like bullshit earnings. So, you know, they got everything except the things that matter in the business. But anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. And but what would happen? Like, what would happen if, like, Twitter, uh, Twitter, uh, Uber disappeared? Like, uh, uh, cabs. Cabs. <laughs> yeah, literally nothing. Yeah. I mean, I would feel bad for the engineering team because they're amazing. I'd feel bad for all the people that work there because they're all, you know, literally trying their best. But how can I, I just I, I I asked this question a lot over the last two years. How can a company that loses a billion dollars a quarter be worth anything? How do you tell me that, you know, their stock is worth ten dollars more today than it was yesterday when they still aren't profitable? Like, what do you, you know, we're supposed to be making guesses based on forward looking earnings. But if their forward looking projections are losses, how is their stock value not negative? I, I'm where, just, you know, I'm just doing math, right? I'm not, they, I'm not talking they, crazy. Where, where like are what they? What Joe's saying is not, he's not nuts. I mean, it's all, this is the entire startup industry. You know, talk about how many companies have never made a profit. I mean, Uber's been around forever. It in a year, they've been profitable quarters, but I don't think they've had a single profitable year. Even when they sold part of their business to China, to, I think it was Didi. I even think that year they weren't profitable and they sold it for like 1.2 billion. So how is that a company? I, I love them. I have been with Uber and an Uber customer since forever. Like since the very beginning, I've used Uber. I love them. But how do you make that much money and not make any money? Well, I think it's more of a security, actually. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's traded as a as a financial instrument that like people will pump up and sell to the next person and so forth. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I've worked at startups, and Lord knows, I got startups asking me if I want to join them right now. And so I know how the game works. And it's like when you're in that game, you you play that game, and you got to know that how that game works, right? And that game's got a lot harder than it is than it used to be because it's harder, and I would say it's going to be easier, and somebody's going to be able to hire more easily too. You know, that's been the, I think the bottle, the choking point for a lot of these companies. You just can't find anyone to work there because, I mean, they, they, all the talent's been locked up at Facebook and Twitter and um, all these companies and Google and everyone else. But I, you know, I wager, uh, you know, uh, Brad Gerstner's letter to, to Mark Zuckerberg last week, for me, the alternative capital letter is like, you got to be cutting a lot of people at Meta. That's, you know, I mean, no, no offense to Viv, but that's, I mean, <laughs> you throw out some pretty large numbers. Uh, I mean, they're, so it's, you know, things are going to happen, I suppose, but that's going to unlock a lot of talent that now can go to these startups. And I think that's, that's probably a good thing at the end of the day, like startups, you know, I'm not, I wasn't here to bash startups. I think, you know, the, the business model is what it is. It's like you, you, until you generate revenue and, you know, things that would, I guess, qualify you as a, you know, a business, I mean, you, you literally are like on life support because you rely on VC funding. But they, again, I work these places. I know how it goes. It's not like I'm stupid and just talking a bunch of crap. Like, um, so you just play that game and hope it works out. So, but you know, in, in this case, I think it's it's going to get easier because you're going to have less competition. So, you know. Yeah, I just wonder how long you can. I mean, there's got to be a time where you say, "Look, how are you not profitable yet?" You know, and I get every startup needs a runway. Every startup needs someone to take a risk and a chance in it in order for innovative technology to ever make it to market because it's expensive. You know, ask Meta how much the metaverse is costing. It's not easy to build that big of a platform. You know, it's going to cost a lot of cash. You have to be able to look at your investors and say, I don't care how low my price is. You can put my share price to whatever you want to. I'm in charge. We're doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have Mark Zuckerberg nerves and play that game of chicken. And Amazon did the same thing. You know, Wall Street Journal wrote him up, wrote up Bezos and said, why don't you stick to groceries? Uh, well, because AWS is now massive, that's why yeah. it's now saving Amazon's grocery business, which is really doing terribly. Mm -hmm. So, right, you know, right. The, but, the, but the difference there is that at some point the pay the the risk paid off. Right, right. There, there was a legitimate plan for 
under what market conditions will that move of focusing on, uh, you know, distributed web, like web services actually pay off? Um, well, and I think everyone says they have a plan, like a path to profitability. Especially mm. now, everyone has a path well, to profitability. You have to say that. Would, 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 you, would you be otherwise like, nah, we, we really don't know how we're going to do this? Well, I think that's what a lot of companies have been doing, right? Like yeah, until yeah. the last six well, months, they've been going, to, yeah, someday. I mean, so maybe maybe I was like, oh yeah, we have a we have a plan, right? I mean, I've seen all these plans. They're basically facsimiles yeah. of other startups at the same stage because like, here's what we need to either do. Here's the trajectory you need to be on for all these different metrics in order to get um, you know, our next round or to IPO or something when nobody's IPOing right now. So it's like, you know, but here's our plan, you know, to be, uh, you know, at least like burn neutral, whatever the hell that means, or just extend our runway for a couple of years. But it's like, I don't know. I mean, there's a certain input that you need, which is revenue. And that's, you know, that's going to be locking up pretty hard. And so, you know, there's only so much money to go around and that's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, sure. how, how, how much does that come down to the right horizons though? Right? Like, cause you can make a plausible plan for the next two moves in chess in any situation. Right. I've done but you, play, you play that out to like 10, right? And what horizon does that break down is kind of my question. Um, I mean, whatever horizon is going to satisfy the people who are asking the question, right? I and mean, that's, that's, that's what it comes down to. It's all bullshit at the end of the day. It's like, there's, there's a reality of the market and there's a reality of what you're, and there's the, the story you're trying to spin in order to get what you need. And also, and there's a story of what people who are listening to you want to hear so they can tell people, their, their stakeholders, what the story is. This is how this works. It's, it's all just, you know, uh, Fugazi, Fugazi. Uh, as, as the old saying goes in a, a famous movie. So, um, just, just, yeah. So, anyway, I'm not sure you know it. I have yeah. to take off actually. So, <laughs> good to see well, everybody. So, yeah, no, good, good to see you. Thank one. you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think, to... Gustav, I think you're asking the right question. You know, what's the runway and how far ahead can you look? But, like I said, at some point, you have to, your story can't be a story for 10 years. I, I just, I don't know how you keep plugging cash into something as a VC that hasn't been profitable for five years. And they're talking about, you know, maybe never being profitable. Like I get Uber has value. If you broke it down as just a, you know, the technology has value, the infrastructure has value, the customer ecosystem has value, the network and marketplace that they've built, those all have value, but they're not profitable. So Yes, they've created an asset. However, the value of the asset to investors seems to be higher than the value of the asset to customers, which is where I, you know, I have I struggle. How, like, at what point do you give up on it and just say it's going out of business? I'm still perplexed by Uber. Like, where, where are they losing money at? Because like they don't own any cars. Um, like, you know, that is it because is they're paying the drivers, paying insurance, they have too many engineers, like, where are they, they lose money? Are they not charging enough? Because I mean, it's not like it's, yeah, it's not charging enough. Yeah. 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 Their problem is, and I, I don't, I'm not bashing Uber. I love them. Like I said, I absolutely love the company and the concept and what they do. I think it's awesome. I'm trashing the business model a little bit with respect to the marketplace. And I think the problem is that they expected self-driving cars to come sooner because that's their only out. When you take the labor cost away, all of a sudden you go, oh, wait a minute, this business model works really well if you have autonomous vehicles. But as long as there is a person in the driver's seat, this doesn't work. Amazon's got the same problem, Amazon Prime has the exact same problem. While there's somebody in the driver's seat, their basic economics is going to continue to get worse. So, and I think a lot of companies are getting to this where it's a race to the bottom. Labor is a commodity, but we are in a labor shortage. So all of a sudden the things that they've been reliant upon aren't there anymore. And that runway to self-driving cars where labor is eliminated, isn't where they thought it was. And like I said, for a marketplace like Uber, there's value, but they're not charging enough. And the problem is they've trained customers to be very price sensitive. They've trained their customers at a particular price point. And now they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. 
So do, do you reckon they were just too early in the in the game then? Because I mean, realistically for them, they're, they're reliant on many other companies reaching the self driving stage. Because honestly, how many how many self driving startups have you seen actually stand up to the existing automotive industry market? Right, like the Dyson pulled out of the electric car market. Forget the self driving car market. Right. Um, uh, I, I was there when it happened. Actually, I was at Dyson when it happened. It was quite an interesting week. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Um, but uh, I mean, Rivian, they're they're, they're standing up. Um, I, I don't know on their profitability. I haven't looked at all, but they're the only name that's other than Tesla that's a non-traditional like automotive company, right? Um, and the other automotive companies are catching up quick. Hyundai and Kia just released a, their like flagship electric cars, right? So they're going to catch up to. Uh, you know, the likes of Tesla and Rivian pretty fast in terms of their actual technology offering, right? Um, but in terms of self-driving, how much is that actually, like the, the, the point for Uber is that they're, they're completely reliant on the industry of the entire automotive industry to catch up to what they need to make that profitable, right? Um, Amazon Prime, on the other hand, they're really just waiting for drone regulation and, and stuff like that becoming a little bit easier. And that, maybe more accessible but the funny thing to me is like i i'd understand uber not being too willing to build their own self-driving cars and stuff like that they, they've they've uh, they sold their self-flying aircraft business at a loss or something right like mm -hmm. if i'm not wrong um but, but someone like amazon i'm surprised they're not hiring more robotics engineers to work on this self-flying drone problem i mean Package delivery drones is not a very difficult concept to adapt existing drone technologies from. Like, they should be, I, I don't know. Like, I mean, if that's their play, why don't they go and hire bunches of robotics engineers and try to solve the problem themselves? Because there's no established industry for that, right? Well, you got to think about it. If they live up to, you know, high reliability standards, five nines, mm -hmm. that means one in if i'm remembering right one in a hundred thousand failures if you do a hundred thousand deliveries a day that means one thing kills somebody every day yeah and so five <laughs> nines all of a sudden doesn't sound so amazing no, you know true. if one drone falls out of the sky every day or every one hundred thousand deliveries you know if, no, you're, could you you're, imagine you're, like you're, you know, every one hundred thousand plane flights you know something hits somebody in the face it's it's not that, a problem that, 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 that's the reality of a, of a robotic system right it's that much more dangerous because you're dealing with it in the physical world it's past litigation now where you can just fire or sue a driver right it's about is the technology willing to stand up to it um it's possible but that market's not yet big enough to you know to make it affordable for a company to do that uh so i mean it's like elon musk said i mean this is a hard problem to solve and as much flack as Elon gets, he's not an idiot. I mean, he, he used to be a very talented engineer. I don't know how he is now, but I'm just saying he used to be at PayPal. No joke. He was a talented engineer. He understands engineering challenges, but he's had the same realization everybody who's tried to tackle self-driving cars has had, which, and me included, I thought we'd have him by now. I bet somebody a very nice dinner in 2017 that we would have significant disruption by now in you know the the automotive industry and trucking and everything else and i was wrong as anybody else was so not pointing fingers i i am the idiot i speak of but it's a harder problem to solve is it? we don't know how to get self-driving cars through people's perception and it's the same thing with drones i mean if i drove the same frequency as a drone did or the same frequency as a self-driving car did i'd get into more accidents than they do if you if you did the metrics on a self-driving amazon versus a human behind the wheel amazon all of a sudden that self-driving car looks really really good but nobody says that about tesla's auto, you know autopilot they're not talking about a comparative and that's one of our problems in data science is we don't know how to talk about reliability we don't understand how to publish reliability requirements, human reliability. How many crashes per mile do we have with a human drove driven semi versus a Rivian? I think Rivians do semis, right? Uh, that's Rivian, you know, versus a Rivian. So how many crashes per mile? And if you look at self-driving cars, Tesla, 
in driving, you know, that autonomous mode compared to a person. How many crashes per mile do we have? When you begin to advertise it from a reliability standpoint, you can say this must be at least as reliable as a person. And if it meets that reliability standard, you're good. Because, I mean, what are you supposed to do? Make it better than us? Really? Come on. Well, well, that's that's the eternal perception of all things robotic, right? Like uh, on a manufacturing line, a human, uh, you know, visual inspector is probably going to have 80% accuracy over over the course of a day, a week, a month, a year, a career, right? Um, a, a model that's supposed to detect defects in, in complex plastics, uh, yeah, sure, that's expected to be 99.9%, right? Like uh, you see it all the time, right? That we just expect perfection because there is no um how do i put this there's no throat to clearly choke somebody it, wrong. somebody who's a very well-known expert in robotics once said to me privately that the the difference between a human and a robot is that humans are way better at covering up their messes oh man that is so true you can't hide the magic smoke guys Mm -hmm. Trust me, we'll try it. You can't hide the magic smoke. Robots just hate giving that stuff out. With that, let's go ahead and wrap it up, y'all. Uh, great discussion. Thank y'all for being here. Thank y'all for watching on LinkedIn. Uh, I thought for the longest time LinkedIn algorithm was punishing me, but we've had steady, you know, mid-teens uh, viewership uh, in, in, in this video. And I got like the biggest uh, engagement on a post like that I've ever had. Uh, recently so that's pretty cool to see so i think linkedin is now rewarding me again so thank you all for being here i don't know why i'm going off on that tangent but thank you all for being here thanks for enjoying uh have a good rest of the afternoon remember my friends you got one life on this planet why not try to do something big cheers